In this video, we're going to be giving a general discussion of block ciphers and the attack models associated to them. So here's a table of contents for this video. It's going to be broken up into two parts. The first part is just a general discussion of block ciphers. We're going to be talking about how do we encode messages using bits and communication channels and the eavesdroppers that exist on those communication channels. We'll talk about the need for block ciphers, which provide the encryption. And we'll talk about sequences of bits, what a general definition of a block cipher is, uh, general construction for block ciphers, and the round function, the key schedule. We'll give some examples of block ciphers that we've talked about on this channel. We'll talk about the concept of keeping a block cipher design secret, and that leads to Kirskov's principle. And we'll talk about the importance of how to establish a secret key. Then in part two of the, of the video, we'll talk about cryptanalysis and the attack models that exist on block ciphers. So we'll talk about the fundamental problems related to cryptanalysis, the most basic attack, which is just brute force guessing. We'll talk about the vulnerabilities of block ciphers, what that means, uh, a common setup for the attack models. And then we'll go through six attack models, the known ciphertext attack, known plaintext attack, chosen ciphertext attack, chosen plaintext attack, adaptive ciphertext attack, and adaptive plaintext attack. And then we'll end the video with a comment where possibly all ciphertext may be cracked in the future. So the first thing is, how do we encode messages with bits? We can actually encode human readable messages like text just using a sequence of bits, namely zero and one. In order to do this, all we have to do is take each character of whatever language you're using. In this case, we'll just talk about English and assign each character of the language a certain bit pattern. And then any text can just be realized as concatenating those bit patterns. For example, one way of doing this for, with English would be with an ASCII table. Every character of English is uh, provided a, a eight bit bit pattern which is representable by a pair of hex characters. And uh, any message in English can be represented in this way using a sequence of bits. For example, to encode a message, let's say, hello, this message has six characters, five are letters and an exclamation point at the end. If we look at the ASCII table, the hex values that are associated to each of those characters are given by these values, and each pair of hex characters corresponds to an 8-bit sequence. In this way, we get a plain text block, which is just the concatenation of all those six characters. Six times eight is 48, so this message is represented by these 48 bits. And this is called a plain text block. Communication channels allow two computers to communicate over a network. And these uh, networks allow us to send sequences of bits over the network. Now, an important thing to say is that we should assume that every communication channel has an eavesdropper. The eavesdropper might be a nation state, like a country, uh, but it could also be some other entity as well. But we should always assume that our communications are being monitored and being stored. So the eavesdropper has the ability to see everything that's being sent over the communication channel. For example, we have two parties that are communicating here. They're sending uh, plain text back and forth over the communication channel, which is represented by this root right here. And if we look at the ASCII table, M is represented by these bits. They're sent over the communication channel and the party receives them. And this party, when he wants to send something to him, the number four, maybe, this is the bit pattern for four in ASCII, and it's sent over the communication channel. But there has been a split in the wire, and every communication that's sent over that communication channel 
is captured by the eavesdropper. He sees everything. And if the communication is not encrypted, then the eavesdropper can just easily read the, the bit patterns and know exactly what is being communicated between these two parties. So that leads us to the question of block ciphers and why do we need block ciphers? So just as we were saying, if two parties are sending ASCII encoded messages over a communication channel, then the eavesdropper will have complete knowledge of their communications. So the question arises, how can two parties communicate over a communication channel and have private messages? In other words, messages that are not known to the eavesdropper. So the first thing is we have to accept that there's no way to avoid the eavesdropper from spying on our conversations. That's unavoidable. For example, uh, a country that lays its own internet cables has complete control over those internet cables. So if the government of that country wants to monitor the communications, there's no way private citizens can stop that. So the solution of the problem of achieving private communications unknown to the eavesdropper is through encryption. So even though the eavesdropper can see all the communications, when they're encrypted, the bits have been scrambled. And that means that even though the eavesdropper still sees the bits being sent, after they've been encrypted, they're unreadable. They're no longer readable ASCII text. And the eavesdropper, even though he sees the bits, he is unable to understand them because they don't make sense anymore. But the party on the other end, which receives these encrypted bits, knows how to decrypt them, which is like unscrambling the bits. And then he's able to read the original message. But the eavesdropper is not able to decrypt the bits. So even though he receives the encrypted ciphertext, he is not able to know the original message. Now, like I was saying, the encryption doesn't prevent the eavesdropper from seeing the communication. It only prevents the eavesdropper from understanding the original meaning of the communication. So the encryption process, it's achieved through an algorithm called the block cipher. And the block cipher requires that a secret key is known only to the parties communicating and not to the eavesdropper. This is critical. Even though nation states, they have great power and great computing resources available, they can still, they, they still are unable to crack messages that are encrypted with publicly available encryption algorithms, namely block ciphers. And this is actually amazing power that's put in the hands of the people. So let's talk a little bit about block ciphers. Uh, first, we'll talk about sequences of bits. We'll let F2 denote the set of bits, in other words, zero and one. And by a sequence of bits, we just mean a sequence of zeros and ones. We'll define F2n, where n is a positive integer, just to be all the sequences of bits of length n, so x1 up to xn. Then F2n is going to have 2 to the n elements. Now, what is a block cipher? Well, first, we're going to take two positive integers, n and k. n is called the block size, and k is called the key size. The elements of F2n are called blocks, and the elements of F2k are called keys. So suppose we were given a function, we'll write it as script b, which goes from F2n cross F2k to F2n. We're going to call b an n-bit block cipher with a key size of k bits if it satisfies a number of properties which we'll now describe. First of all, for each key, k, which is an F2k, we get an associated encryption function E sub K. E sub K goes from F2N to F2N, and it's defined as EK of X equals B of X comma K. The first requirement we need on the block cipher B is that for every key K, the associated encryption function EK is a bijection. And under that assumption, we'll be able to define the inverse of that function, which is called the decryption function dk. So dk also goes from f2n to f2n, but dk is equal to ek inverse. So note that the domain and range of both the encryption and decryption functions is f2n. Any block p in f2n, when considered as an element of the domain of ek, is called a plain text. And any block c, when considered as an element of the range of e of k, is called a ciphertext. 
So EK goes from the set of plain texts to the set of ciphertexts, and DK goes from the set of ciphertexts to the set of plain texts. Now, let's just say we fix a K, capital K, and F2K. If we're given a plain text P, we're going to define the associated ciphertext with respect to that key as C equal to the encryption function EK applied to P. In other words, the block cipher B applied to P comma K. And this value of C is the encrypted version of P with respect to that key K. Whenever we encrypt something, there always has to be a key in the background. When we look at the pair P comma C, that's called a plain text ciphertext pair with respect to the key K. Now, the bits of C are what are sent over the communication channel. The eavesdropper will see the bits of C, but he won't be able to interpret their meaning. The ASCII meaning is in the plain text P, but after the encryption process, C is all scrambled up and it doesn't look like anything that can be recognized. Now, the eavesdropper does not know the key. This is critical. Only the parties communicating know the key. So even though the eavesdropper has the ciphertext, he's not able to apply the decryption function DK to the ciphertext C in order to obtain the plain text P. But the party on the other end of the communication does know the key. So when he receives the ciphertext C, he can apply the decryption function to it and get the plain text P back and therefore know the original message. Now, there are more conditions that we need on a block cipher. First of all, our intention is to use this block cipher for sending bits over computer networks. So for each key K, the encryption functions EK and DK, they must be computable through an efficient algorithm that we can implement in hardware or software. We don't want some type of theoretical functions that cannot be implemented in code or in hardware. And another requirement is that for every key, the encryption function EK must be appearing to be completely random. This function cannot have any special properties that show up or else they may be exploited and there might be a weakness found in the block cipher. Another requirement is that since we're trying to avoid the eavesdropper from knowing the original plain text P, when he receives a ciphertext C, it must be very difficult for the eavesdropper to determine what the plain text P was that produced that ciphertext C. And then similarly, there must be a key recovery resistance. In other words, if the eavesdropper knows many plain text cipher text pairs, for example, PI comma CI, it must be really difficult to find the value of the key K which produced them. Namely, the key K such that EK of PI equals CI for all I. Now, it's actually hard to design a block cipher that satisfies all these requirements and is secure. There is a general construction for block ciphers. It, a uh, cryptographer doesn't have to follow this. He can really design a block cipher in any way he chooses. But in the real world, we see many block ciphers following this general design. So let's just talk about that. And just know that even if a block cipher follows the design we're about to describe, it still doesn't guarantee it's secure. The idea is to construct our block cipher as a sequence of simple round functions. So there will be a number of rounds, and each round will have a round function. And the output of one round is fed into the input of the next round. Why don't we define R to be the number of rounds of our block cipher? And the round functions will be R1 up to RR. Now, in practice, uh, the round functions may all be the same, but maybe the first or last round might be slightly different. Now, each round is going to require a round key. And the key size for the block cipher, remember, is k bits. But the round keys may very well have a different size. Why don't we let the integer l denote the key size of the round keys? So the round functions are going to have the following form. So ri is going to be a function. It's going to go from f2n cross f2l to f2n. For a given round key, ki in f2l, the round function gives a function on n-bit blocks. We keep that ki fixed 
And then ri will be a function from f2n to f2n. In other words, it will operate on n-bit blocks. Now, in the next section, we'll describe the key schedule, but really all it is is an algorithm that takes the original k-bit key k and produces r round keys having l bits each. And once we take our key k and feed it into the key schedule, we get these round keys k1 to kr, and then each one of those round keys is used in the ith round function. And then the encryption function with respect to the key k is just the composition of those r round functions using the r round keys ki. And then the decryption function will just be the inverses of those round functions, but in the opposite order. Now, the key schedule, like we were saying, is just an algorithm which takes the original k bit key and produces the r round keys with l bits each. We could write that as kappa going from f2k to the product of r copies of f2l. And we can write the key schedule function kappa as just kappa of k equals k1 up to kr, where k is an f2k and each round key ki is an f2l. Now, the key schedule also needs to be specified through an algorithm that can be implemented in hardware and software. Here's a general picture of what I'm talking about. We start with a plain text P right here, and we start with the key K. First, the K bit key, capital K, is fed into the key schedule, kappa, and from that is produced R round keys, K1 up to KR. And each of those round keys will be used in the ith round. We start with our plain text and put it into the first round function with the first round key. We get n bits out and then feed that into the second round function with the second round key, etc. All the way till the end, we get the last round function, the rth one, and that uses the rth round key. And then the output of that will be the ciphertext. And that's the value of ek of p. That is the encrypted version of p. And so this is a general construction of a block cipher, which you see in real life. But like I say, the cryptographer could design it differently. And this is just a guideline of how many ciphers are designed. So here are some examples of block ciphers. Usually we use block sizes of maybe n equals 64 bits or 128 bits. And key sizes could be maybe 128 bits or 256 bits and we should think the larger the key size of the block cipher that should correlate to a greater security for the block cipher here are some examples of block ciphers that we've talked about on this channel we got the data encryption standard uh, advanced encryption standard we have two versions of that we've talked about skipjack kuzniachik magma notice the block sizes there are 64 bits 128 bits those are very common. And we see that the key size of the data encryption standard is only 56 bits. That's actually very small, and that makes the cipher insecure, actually. This is an old algorithm. We see that the newer algorithms have large key sizes, for example, 256 bits, and 128 bits. We see in the rounds, they range between 32 rounds and 10 rounds, depending on the block cipher. And then the round key sizes, they range between 128 bits and all the way down to 48 bits for this. Now let's talk about the concept of a secret block cipher. All of the block ciphers that we just listed there are publicly known algorithms. Any person can look them up and study how they're implemented. It might seem like it would be better to keep the design of a block cipher secret from everyone. History shows that the details of secret cryptographic algorithms will eventually be known to a motivated attacker. And the thing is, if the algorithm is kept secret, it never receives the scrutiny of being exposed to the public research community. In fact, the most secure block ciphers are ones that have been known to the cryptographic research community for many years, but still no one has been able to demonstrate a vulnerability. Professors who work in cryptography in academia 
they want to break these ciphers because it would be good for their career. And so they're motivated to do that. So if a block cipher is unable to be cracked by anyone in the public research community, then that's maybe a testament to the security of it. Chris Koff's principle says that the algorithm of a cryptographic system, such as a block cipher, it should be publicly disclosed. And the security of the system should depend entirely on the secrecy of the chosen key, not on the secrecy of the algorithm. So it doesn't matter if the eavesdropper knows which block cipher you're using to encrypt your communications. What is imperative though, is that the parties who wish to keep their encryption secret have to keep the choice of their key only to themselves. Once the eavesdropper knows the key, it's over. But as long as the parties communicating are the only ones who know the key, they are able to enjoy private communications that the eavesdropper does not know. Now, how do we establish a secret key? We've described how encryption relies on the parties knowing a secret key, but the eavesdropper cannot know this key. And if you think about it, we actually have a problem now because if the two parties are communicating over a communication channel where the eavesdropper sees everything, how would they agree on a secret key without the eavesdropper knowing? This is called the key exchange problem. Now, if two parties can meet in person, maybe at a park, in secret where no one else can hear, in particular the eavesdropper, then they can whisper a key to each other and then only they will know the key. But notice that this communication is done outside of the communication channel that the eavesdropper owns. But in most cases, the parties cannot physically meet in person to whisper a secret key to each other. Usually they're located very far apart geographically. And the only means of communication they have is over the communication channel that the eavesdropper owns. And amazingly, there is a way for the two parties communicating over that eavesdropper own channel to establish a secret key, but the eavesdropper does not know that key. So that's pretty amazing. That's called the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, where two people communicating over a communication channel with an eavesdropper can nevertheless establish a secret key, which is only known to them, but not to the eavesdropper. This is done with public key cryptography such as elliptic curve cryptography or RSA. Uh, we won't talk about the Diffie-Hellman key exchange in this video, but we will soon in another video. So for the rest of this video, we're going to assume that a secret key has been established between the two parties communicating, but the eavesdropper does not know this key. So for example, if the two parties have agreed on that key, then they can send messages now. If uh, this party here wants to send a message, he looks at the plain text version of that using ASCII. He encrypts it using the key that's agreed upon and gets a cipher text. That cipher text is what's sent over the cable. When the party on the other end receives the cipher text, since he knows the key, he's able to decrypt it and read the original message. Now, the cipher text that's sent over the channel is routed to the eavesdropper, but now these bits, they don't have any meaning anymore. He doesn't know what they mean. And so he's no longer able to understand the communication between the two parties. But there's likely many communications to go back and forth with the same key. So the eavesdropper is now going to start saving all of these cipher texts because he knows they probably came from the same key. And maybe in the future, he'll have some hope of cracking it. So that brings us to the next part of the video, which is talking about cryptanalysis. And cryptanalysis is a science of recovering information about the plain text or the key when given the ciphertext. Cryptanalysis and cryptography are actually opposite to each other, even though they're obviously intertwined. Cryptography concerns itself with designing algorithms to securely communicate information, whereas cryptanalysis seeks to find vulnerabilities in the algorithms that are designed by cryptographers, trying to crack them. In other words, trying to recover the plain text or the key when the eavesdropper knows the ciphertext. Now, just to know that cryptanalysis is academic in nature, you'll never actually use it in a real world situation like a pen test. Now, the fundamental problems that are associated to cryptanalysis are as follows. According to Kurskov's principle, 
We always assume that the crypt analyst knows the block cipher that's being used to encrypt the communications. The first fundamental problem is if the crypt analyst is given a ciphertext C, how can he find the plaintext P that produced that ciphertext? And the other fundamental problem is if the crypt analyst is given a ciphertext C, how can he find the key K which was used to produce that ciphertext? Notice that if we know a solution for problem number two, that automatically implies a solution for problem number one. In other words, if you know the key K, you can easily find the plaintext. You just take the decryption function with that key K and the known ciphertext, and you'll be able to recover the plaintext. So we should think of the ultimate goal of the crypto analyst is to find that secret key that is known to the parties communicating, but not to him. The most basic attack is brute force, which really just means guessing. So the brute force attack is when the crypt analyst takes the given ciphertext C and then just tries all possible keys K to see if the result of decrypting using this key, namely DK of C, does that give a plaintext P that could be the original plaintext? In other words, maybe it could be ASCII readable. This is the most primitive strategy because it's literally just guessing all the possible keys because there's no other intelligent strategy to, to try. Now remember that the size of F2K is two to the K and usually K is large, like 128. So this would require the computation of at least two to the power of 128 cases, which is actually far too large to accomplish using modern computing. So the vast search space that the key belongs to makes this brute force attack computationally infeasible. And therefore we define a block cipher to be secure if the only strategy available for a crypt analyst is just to try a brute force attack because he has no other intelligent strategy to try. So, so even though the crypt analyst has a full understanding of the block cipher algorithm, he has still no better strategy than just plain guessing. That's what we mean by a secure block cipher. Now, what would a vulnerability be in a block cipher? Well, if there's a strategy or an algorithm to obtain the key faster than a brute force search, then we'd call this a vulnerability or a crack or a break of the block cipher. And we would call the strategy that's able to achieve that an attack on the block cipher. You know, K is at least 128 usually, so a brute force attack would require two to the 128 guesses, like we were saying. Let's say there's a strategy available that we could find the key in two to the power of 127 guesses. Now, this would be considered a vulnerability, but notice that two to the 127 is still way out of bounds of being computationally feasible. So if, if parties were to still use this block cipher to communicate privately, even though a vulnerability exists, it's still able to achieve private communications. So just because there's a vulnerability academically in a block cipher doesn't necessarily mean the crypt analyst can recover the key K or the plaintext P. Now there's a common setup for the attack models we're going to talk about. There's always a fixed block cipher B in the background, which is our object of investigation. And we're looking to discover a vulnerability in it. There's a fixed key K as well that only the parties communicating know. And of course the eavesdropper does not know. Now, once a key has been agreed upon between the parties, we expect that many communications will be sent over the cable, over the communication channel using that same key. The key does not change as the two parties communicate. The same key is used for every communication. So all ciphertext C1 up to CN encrypted with that key will be seen and saved by the eavesdropper. Now, as we said before, the ultimate goal for the crypto analyst is to find a key. But maybe another goal would be just to discover the plaintext P1 up to PN, which are corresponding to the known ciphertext C1 up to CN. Or maybe at this point, he will have enough information so that when he receives the next incoming ciphertext, CN plus one, he will be able to somehow discover the plaintext PN plus one. But really, his main goal is to find the key if possible. Now, here are some different attack models on block ciphers. Each successive attack model gives the crypt analyst more information to work with. 
and therefore a greater chance to find a key or to find any vulnerability. So the known attacks give the least amount of information. The chosen attacks give more information than known attacks. And the adaptive attacks give the most information of all of them. Now, some of the attack models, especially the chosen and the adaptive models, are maybe not too likely to occur in the real world and maybe should be considered more academic in nature. So first of all, the known ciphertext attack, which is also sometimes called ciphertext only attack. That's when the crypt analyst is given a set of ciphertext CI from I equals one to M. This scenario is a, a real world situation because the eavesdropper does see all the ciphertext over the communication channel that has been produced with respect to some fixed key. So this is actually the most difficult attack model for the crypt analyst because it provides the least amount of information. For a known plain text attack, the crypt analyst is actually given a set of plain text ciphertext pairs, PICI, where I goes from one to N. So unlike the known ciphertext attack, here the crypt analyst also knows the plain text PI that corresponds to the ciphertext CI. Now this scenario is less likely in a real world situation because the eavesdropper will not usually know the plain text. He'll know the ciphertext, but not the plain texts. But we just assume in some way that he is able to obtain it. We could imagine a situation where something like this could happen. Sometimes a communication only is important to be kept secret for a short amount of time. And then after that, it doesn't matter if it's publicly disclosed. So the eavesdropper will receive the ciphertext CI and then maybe sometime in the future, when the security is no longer needed, the plain text PI will become known. And then he'll have those pairs, and maybe having enough of those pairs will be enough to find the key K. Now for a chosen ciphertext attack, this attack model is where the crypt analyst gets to choose a, a set of N ciphertext CI from I equals one to N, and then is provided the corresponding set of plain text PI. Now, usually the set of ciphertext that the crypt analyst will choose is based on a strategy. And usually N will be very large, maybe two to the power of M, where M is a little smaller than N. Remember, there's only two to the N possible ciphertext blocks. So we choose two to the M where M is a little smaller. So in a sense, the crypt analyst is given temporary access to the decryption function as a black box. In other words, he doesn't know the key but he is allowed to query the decryption function n times with his n choices of ciphertexts. And a chosen plain text attack is just very similar to that. But in this scenario, the crypt analyst gets to choose n plain text pi, and that is provided the set of ciphertext ci. And again, just the same comments as before, the plain texts are usually chosen with the type of strategy, and most likely the value of n will be very large. So in this scenario, the crypt analyst is given temporary access to the encryption algorithm as a black box. He provides n plain texts. Those plain texts are fed into the encryption algorithm, and he receives the n ciphertexts. For the adaptive ciphertext attack, the crypt analyst is allowed n sequential queries to the decryption function. After query j, where j is between one and n, but j is less than n, at that point he has j plain text ciphertext pairs PICI. And then for his next query, the J plus one query, he makes up a ciphertext CJ plus one, and he can choose that based on the results he's received so far. And then he's given the value of the plain text PJ plus one. So in the chosen ciphertext attack, all of the ciphertext CI had to be chosen at the start of the attack. But for this one, the adaptive ciphertext attack he can adapt his choice for the next ciphertext based on the results he's received up to that point. And then the adaptive plain text attack is just the opposite of that. In this one, the crypt analyst is given n sequential queries to the encryption function. So after query j, where j is less than n, he has j plain text ciphertext pairs PICI. And then for the next query, the j plus one query, he chooses a plain text PJ plus one, which can be made up 
based on the results that he's received so far, and then he's given the value of the corresponding ciphertext CJ plus one. So remember in the chosen plain text attack, he had to provide all of the plain text PI at the very beginning. But with the adaptive plain text attack, the crypt analyst can adapt his choice for the next plain text based on the results that he's received up to that point. So that gives it more power. And now we'll just end the video with this comment that we could assume that all communications on the internet are stored in massive databases, at least those communications of possible interest, right? And soon when quantum computers become a reality, all of these ciphertexts will be trivially cracked. And so in a sense that even though currently we can enjoy private communications, the eavesdropper is storing all of those ciphertexts in a big database. And in the future, when very powerful new age computers come, all of those ciphertexts in those massive databases will all be cracked. So in the future, we should expect that all of the private communications that we've enjoyed will be known to the eavesdropper. All right. Thank you for watching. Bye.